um, this is Dr. Beckerman. She's a botany and plant pathology professor. And you're going to be talking about disease management bitter rot today. Is that right? I am. And what would be a talk if I didn't get to make fun of Michigan? So, uh, Beatrice, are we okay to start? Yes, you're good to go. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckerman. I'll put it over to you. All right. So uh, I'm giving a shortened version of this talk on bitter rot. Uh, as was asked earlier regarding the pesticides, I'm going to give you a diversity of pesticide options just because uh, um, what normally would be available may not be. And there are pesticide shortfalls uh, throughout not just our industry, all the industry and throughout the country. So uh, I think as per the usual flexibility is going to be the key, but not so flexible that you're selling things that look like this and calling them apples. So before I get started, I'm gonna just warn you that the majority of this talk is about bitter rot, but we will, most of what I'm telling you here will also work for black rot and white rot. Um, for the most part, if you're managing bitter rot pretty well, your numbers for both black rot and, and white rot are going to go down. Just to distinguish them with black rot, you generally have a darker lesion. Black rot has the potential to be more devastating just because it can actually cause uh, cankering and overwinter in the branches. It also has this foliar phase, this leaf spot phase here, which uh, we often refer to as frog eye leaf spot. This is uh, different than white rot. White rot does have a uh, wood infecting or wood damaging phase, but it's, it's less common and less aggressive. Uh, in general, when we look at this rot, um, it's kind of referred to as uh, applesauce in a sack. Uh, it's, it's pretty gross. Um, one of the problems with it is that how it persists on the tree, and this is also true of black rot and of course true of bitter rot, um, in that its ability to persist on the tree as a mummy provides uh, a ready court for infection the following year. So that's one of the biggest issues with this. And as an interesting aside, the canker phase of this pathogen was actually first identified here in Indiana. Uh, so when we talk about bitter rot, I wanna stress that this isn't a new problem. It's uh, one of those things, if you go back and uh, before I, I dive into anything, I try and uh, review the literature and see what's already been done so I don't waste my time reinventing the wheel. And uh, you can see here that in Illinois, there was a, a report, it's actually a, a pretty substantial document about the impact of this disease. And actually in 1916, uh, the USDA uh, hired artists to create these drawings and, and bitter rot was documented there. Um, and anybody interested in Twitter can go on there and, and get regular feeds of some of these uh, vintage uh, drawings of apples and diseases and other agronomic crops. So I'm gonna just talk about bitter rot right now. And, um, oh, Tim, what's, what's your question? Can you, I don't, somebody un unmute Tim? Yeah, <clears throat> have you found that some cultivars are more susceptible than others? I get it on Jonathan's and uh, nothing else really. And I can't figure out, we get the same spray schedule but I, I don't know why, I can't figure out why Jonathan's give me so much trouble. Uh, well, I, I, would, I am going to go into that because there are definite differences. Uh, it's interesting. I think you're the first person to have told me that Jonathan's been giving them trouble. Most of the people report that it is uh, Honeycrisp, Empire, uh, Cameo, and Granny Smith, it seems to me, uh, that have been bigger issues. But, you know, your issues that you have are, are your issues. And um, I, I will, I promise you, talk about that. And that goes into the, the host aspect of the disease triangle. We do have this host, these host differences. We have these uh, environmental differences as well that are so important. And of course, we have the um, pathogen. Uh, and so I'm just going to go through that then. And so mentioning this, most cultivars are susceptible to varying degrees um, to, to go with Tim's question. Um, the most quote unquote resistant varieties, you know, and by that we're talking pretty much about Red Delicious or Rome Beauty would only be considered moderately resistant. They still can get this disease problem. 
Um, so when we're looking on these different hosts, one thing to keep in mind that the symptoms oftentimes appear different on different cultivars. And uh, so here's uh, my rogues gallery of different cultivars showing different symptoms. Sometimes something that seems to be moderately resistant or more resistant, you don't see these symptoms show up until they go into to storage as in the case of ambrosia over here. Um, other times like honey crisp, it gets really bad out in the field. Um, you can have little small lesions, uh, little infections of the lenticel to some of these big honking lesions uh, that we see oftentimes on Honeycrisp, on Gala, and on varieties that have Honeycrisp in the background, like uh, Rosalie we have here. When we talk about susceptibility, um, you know, for a long time it was Golden Delicious, uh, a variety called Nitt Nittany that came out of uh, Penn State was considered to be a, a fairly susceptible variety. Um, but you can see we're looking at orders of magnitude different. And I apologize for the differences in scale. Here we have 100% infection with uh, no fungicide controls on Honeycrisp compared to our no fungicide control with Golden Delicious. And this was in 2014, we had less than 5% infection. Um, keep in mind that Golden Delicious was considered to be a, a susceptible variety. Um, so Honeycrisp is way worse. Uh, Tim is saying he's having problems with Jonathan. I know other people who have had comparable uh, problems with Empire um, right here. Uh, so that's uh, a really important point. Um, don't worry about the data here because I will definitely be talking about the different fungicides and how to better manage it. Just please know that there, there are a lot of options. So then when we're building this disease triangle, which is really so important, I mean, I know it seems simple and I, I know I make fun of it and how like this is my benediction with all my talks, uh, but it really does help to understand what's going on and, and what we're seeing differently. Um, one of the big differences are a lot of these newer varieties, uh, particularly, you know, Honeycrisp, uh, some of the Honeycrisp backgrounds that we're, we're talking about, which, I mean, people love them because they have the crunch and they have the flavor. Unfortunately, they have the bitter rot susceptibility uh, as well. Another issue is the pathogen. And for the longest time, when I first started working on this, it, there seemed to be, we, we knew that there were at least two different species of pathogens. Um, but when we grow these, uh, in the laboratory, we noticed that there was probably even more. And it took a lot of molecular detective work to actually figure out what exactly was going on here. And I just am using this as an example to show you the morphological differences. What we know now is that what we thought were only two different species or two complexes, we have at least five different species of bitter rot pathogen, these are colitotricums. And colitotricums are also gonna be causing problems in your melons, they're gonna be causing problems on your peppers and your tomatoes as well. Um, these diseases are driven by warm, wet weather. So going back to that disease triangle, we, we need the wet weather, we need these virulent pathogens, and we also need to have the susceptible host. And I really think one of the reasons the the plant pathologist involved in this got so excited about finding all these different species is it's a lot easier to identify different species than it is to come up with the management um, of the disease. Now, now the last thing, so we know that there's a lot more pathogens than what we originally thought. We know that there are new cultivars that have changed, but the biggest issue going on here is the environment. And um, what we're seeing by way of uh, environmental effects on this crop. Many, I mean, some of you here have grown apples for longer than I've been alive. Um, and we're seeing things that you haven't seen in your lifetime before and things that really we only know from historical records. The first of these is the, the crop loss issues that we've had due to freeze. Um, and that's obviously, you know, it can be up to 100% loss and that's a huge issue. What we don't consider when we think about those crop losses is the damage that also happens to the tree uh, in that same period of time. The other issues that we're not taking into account are the changes that we're seeing in the number of chilling hours that our trees are getting, in addition to the fact that uh, our weather has been really, really wet uh, for the last couple of years, and it's also been uh, really hot. Hold on, I'm gonna apologize right here. I have a parrot who's gone rogue on me and he is deciding to eat my wall. Charlie. 
get over here, you little monster. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so what's interesting is that most Americans don't think they are personally affected by climate change. And I, in my experience, uh, farmers are not in this group of people. Um, but I did think this was a really interesting discussion point to bring up uh, because of course there are people who seem to think that, you know, this is a normal blip. Whereas within the scheme of things, this is starting to trend a, a little more unusual. And, and this here is just anecdata. And this was a photo that was sent to me by, by Ryan. And I don't even know if he's online or not. Um, and I think this was 2019, uh, but this was 24 hours in, in Indiana. And obviously with an issue of freeze, there's a chance of, of losing part or all of the crop. But the other issue, as I mentioned, is the fact that you know, the crop could be damaged. And then there's the issue of having to um, manage disease even when you don't have a crop. So things are definitely getting weirder. Uh, another picture of some of the crop damage. Uh, when we had our first freeze in 2007, that was at least in where I lived, the, the worst part in 74 years, um, or the first freeze in 74 years. And we've since had three freezes since then. So this is happening more often. Um, what's happened along with this is this change in chilling hours. And I think this is something we're overlooking. I, I think that the freeze is something that we can really focus on but the change of chilling hours is a more subtle thing that we're overlooking. And if we look at the data, and this is going from historical records, just going back to 1980, to seeing where it was from 1980 to 2010, and then taking the mathematical equation that all of us were taught, but very few of us learned, including me, or struggled with in, in high school algebra and geometry, um, if you take that slope and extend it as to how it looks now, what it will look like in the future, we're starting to trend a lot hotter. And as a result, our um, uh, period of much warmer weather and uh, loss of chilling hours is going to increase. The consequence of this is that not just that we're losing plants because of the freeze damage outright and having these um, early bud breaking events followed by freezes. But we're also seeing plants that uh, are taking much longer to break bud. We're getting this unevenness here. And I'm gonna just show a picture. And I know a lot of you have been reporting this, that the plants aren't breaking bud all at once. What we're seeing actually is we have a little bit of bud break here. These guys are still dormant. Um, and it's taking literally, uh, it's a staggered bloom over the course of not only several weeks, but over a month. So I'm gonna go back here and just show what the historical record is versus what some of um, different parts of Indiana, what our observed record, what our observed situation is and what it's predicted. Um, so somebody was giving me a hard time about, I think it was Eric, that um, I wasn't giving him the news he wanted to hear, and I'm just gonna continue on with that, um, that we're gonna be seeing a lot more of our apples having this, this staggered bud break period. And so some of you are probably thinking, well, what does this have to do with bitter rot? Well, the problem is, is that we're actually, uh, if you're trying to control a disease that's coming in around uh, bloom, and you have multiple bloom events, it's very difficult to actually um, keep timing your sprays or doing the spray over and over to keep, uh, keep disease control. I'm gonna revisit the chilling hour and the spraying schedule in a moment, but in addition to, as I go to this third leg of the triangle, the environment, we can see here that it isn't just the chilling hours that have changed, but we're also getting a lot wetter more often and more severely. Um, this is uh, another Indiana orchard taken in 2020 uh, and flooding has obviously been a, a huge issue in a number of different places. Um, and, and this, the, the flooding component of this isn't causing a problem with bitter rot per se, because bitter rot is an above ground foliar disease problem. I mean, we are gonna have to address issues of Phytophthora 
um, when we have a situation like this. My point here being is that if you're getting all of this rain, it's very hard to keep a fungicide on. Keep in mind that when you are applying a fungicide, uh, for every inch of rain, you lose 50% of your coverage. So by two inches of rain, you'll have lost almost all of your protection. Um, and so this is going to mean that not only do we have the staggered bloom that requires a longer period to protect, but we're going to have to have more frequent applications in order to keep that protection effective. Uh, to make matters even worse, because we have to keep applying things and the rain issue, we all, because of these repeated applications, we're, we're gonna have to deal a lot more with fungicide resistance. It isn't just a question of chilling hours with the environment. It isn't just the, the rain, but we're also dealing with issues of heat and with heat comes sunburn. Um, and this, there isn't a lot of data, but I, I don't think anyone would really dispute that there is this um, relationship between sunburn and bitter rot, uh, sunburn particularly and white rot as well. And not only that, but we know certain varieties. Um, Honeycrisp is the best known variety at, as it does have, I believe, the thinnest uh, skin. I'm, I'm wondering now about that if ambrosia might be similar, but these guys do have really thin skin and are prone to uh, sunburn. Gale is another variety there. Um, I really like this picture one of the growers sent to me who will remain nameless um, because it encapsulates two big issues that we have, maybe three. We have Honeycrisp here, that would be issue number one. We have the sunburn that Honeycrisp is particularly uh, susceptible to. And then we have the mummies that uh, stayed on that are actually causing this disease problem. So previous reports regarding weather um, and this was done by Al Jones up in Michigan in 95, He's, he tied it with the more unusual warm weather conditions. Um, I would say it's a combination of all of these things. Uh, what's interesting is Al Jones reported only a, a two to 3% loss. And we're looking, you know, combining data from other people, we're looking at at least a 30 plus percent loss from 2010 to present. Uh, and again, the heat injury and sunburn definitely is playing a role in this. Sometimes it's very difficult to actually, you know, when you're looking at something like this, this is obviously really severe sunburn. And we don't tend to recognize some of these lesser symptoms of sunburn as causing a shutdown in the plant defense response and an injury and providing a really good infection court for um, the bitter rot pathogen to take advantage of. So. That was a litany of really bad news. Um, the biggest issue tying all of this together is our choice of susceptible varieties, which is something we can control. We can't control the pathogen and we can't control the environment. And so what do we do to actually manage this problem? Um, obviously the biggest is uh, not putting our eggs in one basket. And obviously we're all gonna grow Honeycrisp and some of these very susceptible varieties. What we want to do is make sure we balance it and have other varieties that are less susceptible. We need to examine which fungicides actually work best to manage this disease, when they should be applied and how often. Um, and then are there cultural controls we can actually use to uh, better? These aren't silver bullets, but they will help. This goes back to this whole flattening the curve and this flattening the curve uh, we do that by making sure the orchard is clean, making sure the trees are pruned so any cankers are removed and the canopy is opened up. I'm going to talk a little bit about thinning fruit because that also has a role and even looking at sunburn control. So the first part of this is what fungicides can we use? And, and this is actually the sheet from the bitter rot trial. Um, I've been trying to do this trial now since 2020. Uh, we were, we lost the crop in, uh, what, 2019, 2020, and 20, no, 2020 and 2021, hoping 22 is the charm here. Um, good or bad news in between then, we, we did actually get some data to find out what was or wasn't actually uh, effective or not. So um, that is actually helpful. What we will be looking at are, oh, sorry about that, looking at our 
looking at the different timings to see which products control best, um, and also looking at a few things that um, might be a little bit surprising. Um, one of this is flutioxinol. I don't know if there are any strawberry growers um, around. Flutioxinol isn't labeled, but it works pretty well against Colitotricum on strawberries. So we are throwing, ay, ay, throwing that in there. And the other is just looking at straight cabrio, which is the active ingredient, the uh, QOI or the FRAC11 fungicide of Marivon and, is that, yeah, Marivon and Pristine, um, and seeing if that, how that works alone. Last but not least, I'm so sorry, um, is Raynox which is actually to protect sunburn. So that's gonna be my trial for this next year, assuming I have a crop. What we have found from previous bits of work that we've done is that diphenaconazole, which um, uh, Keith Yoder at the University of Virginia, who since retired had really, really good results one year, but when we included it in another year, uh, we found no statistical difference and it, it was significantly worse than um, Captan. Uh, some of the products that will work, and I think this is really important, particularly in light of the fact that it's so difficult to get fungicide, uh, these are the products that we want to rely on. And, and here's one that um, Sarah Volani is kind of talking me into, um, and that's Furbam. And this is more for processing apples, uh, but this is an effective fungicide. It is actually registered for um, use on apples uh, and uh, also for bitter rot, which is, um, makes it unique in a lot of these fungicides. So I've given you a list of what we're looking at in the future, and, and I didn't wanna belabor like work we did with uh, pH and stuff like that. Um, so the next part of that bitter rot trial that I showed you was actually looking at when to best time the fungicide application. And in reading the literature, the general consensus was is that we could start applying fungicide after petal fall and that we would have sufficient control uh, with that application. However, what we found is that it actually didn't provide as good of control. And this isn't the best study to show this, but this is the one that was uh, PowerPoint ready, shall we say. Um, so here you can see where we were applying fungicides at um, petal fall. And you can see here that we, we didn't, I mean, we, we got very good control. Okay, so if you can get that application on at petal fall, it's certainly much better than not doing anything at all. Um, but by just applying the fungicide slightly earlier, we were able to significantly reduce and significantly in the statistical sense of the word. Um, it was, and this is where it gets kind of jiggy because when we talk about something statistically, that's a mathematical number. You know, when I looked at these plants or other people looked at these plants, we had a much better harvest from the plants we treated earlier than the plants that we treated later. Um, this observation was borne out by the mathematical analysis that said there was a statistical significance. So keep in mind, again, one of the problems that we're all fighting against is that this uneven bud break, which requires multiple applications. And this could be why the earlier applications provided better control, because we were um, getting in early and preventing the disease from getting established. Um, we found Captan actually works really well. And so I would say ideally Captan is gonna be the, the best product for season long use, particularly later on in the season when you've exceeded the 77 day PHI that goes with Mancazeb. If you can't get these two products, Furbam and Zyram are options. Zyram provides control um, Based on the literature, it appears that uh, Captan does provide statistically significant better control, but something is better than nothing. Um, and the use of Zyram can help you keep your Captan levels under 40 pounds per acre per year, which if you have a really wet year and frequent rains um, can be an issue. Other things that we found, um, and this isn't just my work, but the work that um, we've done with Sarah Volani at NC State 
and with Philip Brennan uh, at the University of Georgia is that paraclostrobin, the FRAC11 component of Marivon provided the best control because it had the highest level of paraclostrobin. So it was better than pristine. Um, both of these, those were better than Luna Sensation or Flint Extra uh, and better than Sovereign. Of all the SDHIs, which there's a smorgasbord of them right now, Aprovia is the only one that actually provides reliable control against bitter rot. This is work that Sarah was able to do because in 2020, she had a crop. Um, in 2021, all three of us, Phil, Sarah, and I, we all lost our crops due to freeze. So how or what can you do to find this information? You know, this is uh, going back to Tim or Eric's comment. This was one of the driving forces to put this here. I know everybody has, you know, I hope you guys have your favorite fungicides. We all know I have my favorite fungicides. Um, but unfortunately right now we can't always get what we need. And so this provides you a list of options. We tried to give you the efficacy ratings um, and keep in mind that, you know, I, I said that, you know, Maravon was better than um, Pristine, but uh, Pristine is still a pretty good fungicide unless you have a resistance issue. Um, and so that would be something to, to consider. Here you can see that we have Miravis, which is the Pideflumet, Pideflumet, oh my gosh, I can't even pronounce these anymore, Pideflumetophen, um, which is considered suppressive. And so things that I wouldn't normally recommend, you might want to actually consider. It does give you good uh, scab control and other issues that uh, you have to deal with. Let's talk about cost. Um, I'm not sure cost is necessarily going to be the, the big driving force. It's going to be availability. And I want to apologize. This was part of another talk. Obviously, we are not using Bravo Weather Stick in an apple orchard. And, and please don't. It's pretty phytotoxic. Um, Captan is a, a really worthwhile approach for managing bitter rot. Um, I, I highlighted those early on in the season, maybe using Coside if you need to. It's good for scab. Um, these are all your multi-site things. It probably does have a little bit of kickback if you have any cankers lying around of bitter rot and or black rot. Um, probably for your money though, for, for bitter rot, the, the two best are gonna be Captan and Roper, uh, followed by using um, Maravon, Pristine, uh, or Luna Sensation. Now I wanna show you one interesting thing about the spray guide that you know nobody's commented to me yet, but I, I'm kind of waiting for that. Um, if you look up your Mancazeb product, and we went with Roper because I, I have all of this in a database and I need to go with one name. And I realize not everybody has the same name, but um, trying to deal with 50 different generics, just trying to deal with all of this has is, is been a nightmare. Um, this isn't a typo, um, bitter rot, Mancozeb is not actually labeled for bitter rot. And this isn't an artifact of the Roper label. This is true of all of the labels. Um, as you can see here, I tried to show here's Pencozeb, there's Manzate, um, people. Uh, so I want you to understand that when we're controlling bitter rot using Roper, we're really controlling scab um, or maybe rust. Um, but we don't have a direct label for Roper. And that's just something to keep in mind for uh, when you're doing your record keeping. So at this point, is it worth it? What are my choices? Um, always go with good sanitation and low disease levels. Um, this is sort of like, you know, uh, I'm joking here that I also want world peace and no child to ever go hungry. Um, all of these things are about as achievable as keeping a, a super clean orchard, but there are things that we can do to improve orchard sanitation um, and reduce disease levels. And I'll talk about those right after this slide. You wanna incorporate Captan and Mancozeb in your early sprays and definitely use Captan in later sprays if possible. If it isn't, I would switch over to Zyram. 
um, if you are using captan, and this is only a problem for captan, um, this is the addition of an acidifier, and this is only a problem if your water has a pH greater than eight. Now in our orchard out at MIGS, the water is starts off at about 8.3 and it gets up to about 8.9 by August. So this is a, a problem for us. Captan will literally uh, hydrolyze, which is fall apart in 20 minutes. And uh, by 40 minutes or the time it takes to spray, you might have lost everything. And so for a very small uh, investment, adding an acidifier like LI700 really improves the outcome. And Phil Brannon did this work as well and, and had similar results because he has very highly alkaline water. Um, just before harvest, doing a pre-harvest spray of Marivon or Pristine, this would knock back any um, latent infections. And this is gonna be really important in hot, wet years. Uh, most important is actually trying to get things into storage as quickly as possible, which I mean, I realize this goes up here with world peace and no child to ever go hungry, because I realize not only are you faced with fungicide shortfalls, but you're also faced with labor shortfalls. But one year we actually looked at applying different fungicides just before harvest to see what effect it had in storage. And what we found is that we harvested everything and got it into storage so quickly we had reduced all of the disease, you know, simply by 90% by doing that. So really important way to keep in mind. So I wanna just go over sanitation quickly here. Um, poor sanitation is, you know, I, I show this because this is like so amazing and I've never seen anything like this. Um, and I still don't know how they could have gotten such a clean orchard, but you know, this is the, the orchard I do my work in, and, and you wanna be somewhere between these two. Um, you don't wanna have this much leaf litter down on the ground. You certainly don't wanna have these kind of mummies because these mummies are where the fungal spores, whether it's bitter rot, black rot, or white rot are coming in and infecting the, the fruit the following year as it develops. Um, so in order to make all of those sprays count, um, not only do you want it to be clean, and this goes, and this is tied to those, those mummies we just saw, but you want to make sure that your, your canopy is open and you're not going to have very good coverage or it's going to be really hard to get the penetration in. So if you're increasing your pressure to get your spray into this canopy, odds are that all of the, the fruit on the outside and the leaves as well, but we don't care about those so much, but all of the fruit the, the fungicide is gonna run off. And so we're not gonna have the level of control. Yeah, Tim. I, I don't have my spray guide completely okay. memorized. Um, when you say early, early spray, what's your definition for this, for this discussion? I, I would recommend it pink. And that should carry you over bloom and then apply again at petal fall. I think the infection is occurring, it's starting at bloom. And if you don't spray anything from pink until bloom, you're going to have a certain level of disease that because of the nature of this pathogen is going to uh, grow exponentially. I do religiously read the spray guide, by the way. So I appreciate the effort it takes to go into that. Well, I, I, I appreciate that you read it religiously. I sleep with it. Um, it follows me everywhere. It's my new best friend. I saw Don Lewis got on here earlier and he will attest to the fact that the spray guide and I are, are now inseparable. Um, I wanna talk about thinning, which goes back to sanitation and also goes back to um, getting that spray in there. When you have this many apples, obviously this is too late to thin, but a lot of times when I'm seeing problems, particularly with bitter rot, it's on really, really dense clusters. Um, so when you are thinning, we, we have multiple problems here. So the, the first problem um, is the later thinning, which leaves mummies and pygmy, pygmy fruit on the tree. Um, and this happens more often when you're using your, your NAA and 6BA products, um, the second problem is if you're hand thinning and dropping the fruit that, oops, sorry, all of these also serve as reservoirs and inoculum. And so it's really important to make sure 
that if you are hand thinning, one, God love you for being able to have the, the labor to do something like that. Make sure you're hauling these away. The next is trying to make sure you get rid of these mummies. Um, let's see if I can get this here, right here, because this is coming in and infecting during bloom. And uh, several growers have told me that they put an early effort in when they were pruning to make sure they remove these things. And, you know, I know it would be so easy if you could like shake a branch and it would fall off, but it doesn't, you have to pull them off. And I, I mean, it's, uh, you end up taking layers of skin off if you're not wearing gloves at the time you're trying to pull them off. You'd think they'd come off easily, but they don't. And a lot of that has to do with um, waiting too late to thin. And then of course, when you're not thinning, not being able to get the fungicide in there and then the bitter rot getting in there instead. So I think I went over time. And so I'm going to just uh, reiterate by saying, you know, this is the time right now to be removing the dead wood, removing those mummies, um, any fallen fruit or any hand thin fruit should be removed as well. Begin your fungicide application at pink. Uh, one of the treatments I'm gonna throw in this year is called Rainox, which is a reflective coating, which has been demonstrated to reduce sunburn. And I'll be curious to see if it uh, demonstrates to not just reduce sunburn, but bitter rot problems. Um, and one of the things I didn't talk about, but might be a problem as well, and maybe Elizabeth can bring this up, is that um, some of the growers who have had problems with bitter rot and with white rot in particular, seem to have a problem with brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and so that might be, the, the stink bug might be creating a, an additional infection court for the fungus to infect. So with that, I'm sorry that was so much so quickly, um, but I'll be happy to take a question or two if I still have time. Thank you, Dr. Beckerman. So I wanted to, um, can you share your screen, Dr. Long? I wanted to introduce you. You're the entomology Associate assistant professor of entomology, and you're going to be speaking about insect pest diagnostics, signs and symptoms and pictures. Thanks, everybody. And um, I learned a lot from your talk, Jana. That was exciting. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the stink bugs, because that is something I'm interested to hear from from the audience today if they're having a lot of problems. Um, so I have to admit, I'm relatively new to tree fruits. They're delicious um, and I love the orchards. They're quite romantic, I guess, if you're not doing all the work. <laughs> um, so um, I just wanna share a little bit with, with everyone today. Some of you may be very um, advanced uh, growers. Some of you may be just beginning. So I thought I would just walk through some images because those are always really helpful. And it's nice to talk about things um, as you see them in real time, really focused on this idea of knowing which insect um, or having a better idea of how to diagnose an insect problem in, in your tree fruit. So this is a quick list of topics. Um, so kind of the first, well, there's lots of slides and most of them are pictures, but I kind of want to provide some guidance on what to look for, where and when. And so I'll break this down into kind of three parts um, and pictures, signs of insects, symptoms of their damage, and then the diagnostic features of the quote culprit. Um, and this is usually the, the around the time we get uh, specimens from folks who are submitting them to the, the pest diagnostic, the plant pest diagnostic clinic here at Purdue. And I get really excited um, getting my hands on insects and seeing their damage. And then I'll wrap up just very briefly talking about uh, kind of bigger picture re resources that I think would be helpful um, for the audience today. So I'll talk a little bit about scouting tips and monitoring tools that are available, hopefully answering some questions that I saw in the chat about um, coddling moth traps. I think that was one question that popped up. And then just refer you to these great resources that we have, the Purdue Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab and then the Midwest Fruit uh, Pest Management Guide, which Jan has already referred to. So um, before I get started, there is a quick poll question, and this is really um, for me to get a sense of what you're all challenged by, uh, struggling with, insects maybe that you see most commonly. And I'm interested in this because um, many of you probably know my, my predecessor, Rick Foster, who has, who has now retired but has an amazing, uh, amazing experience that I'm, I will eventually work my way towards and maybe never reach. So I'll use this, uh, your responses to kind of guide um, my efforts uh, as I learn more and work with insects in the orchard. So I'll give you all a little bit. I see 18, oh nice, we're coming up here. So it looks like um, 
Well, the top three insects it looks like folks are struggling with um, are challenged by our stink bugs, beetles of different kinds, and caterpillars, which are what I would expect. So I'll give folks another couple of seconds here. Okay, it looks like we've leveled off. About 35 people responded um, at the top of the list, caterpillars and stink bugs. So thanks for your responses. I'm going to, I think, do I stop this? Okay, it looks like someone else did. Okay, so I'm going to move forward then into the first uh, kind of section of, or the introductory kind of signs and symptoms part. Um, so mainly what I wanna help you do if you are not doing this already is know when and where to look for insects on your tree fruit. And so the first bullet I have here is one that I think you're all very familiar in doing anyway. Um, consider the life stage of the insect that, that you're struggling with. You've probably seen it in some way or maybe have knowledge from somebody if, if you're not a particularly experienced, experienced uh, grower yet. And I would say typically, you know, you're probably seeing these insects or their signs and symptoms of their damage a certain time of year um, around a, cert a certain uh, plant phenological stage. So maybe like pre-bloom or at pink, uh, those kinds of things. So I have an image here of these rose sawflies on some rose bushes in my front yard, which of course are not tree fruits. But um, now that I know that they're there, I go out there every year because I know that they will be there. I've kind of gotten a handle on it. So it's the same kind of approach you would use in your orchard, except it's you know going to be quite a bit more challenging. You have a lot of larger uh, trees to walk and look at. So as we go through the presentation today, when I talk about signs, what I'm referring to are actual parts of the pest itself. So the sign is going to be some element of the insect that is actually there, um, the insect's body or some covering that it's hiding under or um, something that's left behind. It's frass, which is insect solid waste. It's honeydew, which is the liquid insect waste. And then webbing, cask skins or shed skins. So those are the actual signs. Um, the symptoms are changes in plant appearance. And these are going to be signals, um, as I like to think of the plants calling out and saying something's wrong. Things that are like yellowing, leaf curling, dieback, um, you know, those kinds of things. So with those in mind, um, I just want to mention or take this a step further and break it down between the types of, of damage you might expect from a piercing sucking versus a chewing insect. And so this is getting a little bit nerdy, I know, but I really think this will be helpful for those of you who may not um, approach this this way. So I have a, a nice image of a brown marmorated stink bug here. We see it's got its mouth part stuck into this apple. And this is actually just the, the larger part of the mouth part you can see, but actually pushing down through this apple is like a needle-like stylet. And if you were to flip the stink bug over, it's, its mouth parts actually lay down all the way between its, its front two legs. So it's a long kind of um, needle-like mouth part. And they basically are probing the, the apples, the stems, the blossoms, um, well, the apple in this case, but depending on the insect, they may be feeding on different parts of the plant. And basically they're trying to sip that juice, right? Or sip the plant sap. That's how they make their living. And generally speaking, injury by um, piercing sucking insects like the stink bug are gonna appear as sunken depressions. They may look like dimples or even bruising. And I myself get confused looking if we receive apples at a certain time, depending on how they've been stored or what the conditions were. Sometimes the stink bug damage, as Jana mentioned, um, creates these entry points for other types of uh, pathogens. And so kind of depending on how those things happen in time, it can be hard to say, okay, well, what, what damage was there first, the stink bug or, um, and did this lead give an opportunity for a pathogen to get into the apple? We're, I'm still learning on that. So any pictures you have, um, excited to see those and, and learn more um, moving forward. So some common insects that you're likely to see in the orchard that will, um, that have this type of feeding strategy are the scales, the aphids, the stink bugs, and leaf hoppers. So of course, if you, um, of the insect kind of classes, you have those that are piercing and sucking, and then those who are chewing. And this is, I think, more straightforward, obviously easy to see damage by these kinds of insects because they chew through the fruits or chew through plant stems or foliage, just like you or I do um, with, with our teeth and, or in their case, their mandibles. So I have that, um, a nice image here of these apple curculios, which are um, a snout beetle. You can see this is their long snout. Um, I would argue it's a charismatic snout, uh, poking into the apple, and feeding. And if you were to look at their mouth parts under a microscope, you would actually see these little chewing mandibles under there. They're not visible to the naked eye, but you can see 
um, at least in this case, these open kind of feeding wounds, they, they're not very smooth on the edges. If you were to look under a microscope, they're kind of ragged. And um, if we do get specimens um, of fruit or leaves or other plant parts, we can look at them under the microscope. And this is kind of what we're looking for. So these open holes and then the ragged edges because no one you know, chews this, this cleanly and perfectly um, in the insect world. So um, some common insects that have this type of feeding strategy is, as you're likely all aware, caterpillars are notorious chewers um, and also beetles. And I'm just putting here that the adults and the larvae actually have this mandibular chewing feeding strategy. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about the signs. And remember, these are things, the actual insects themselves or um, you know, essence of the insects that are left behind. So here, um, I have an image of woolly apple aphids on an, af on an apple stem. And so um, if you were to walk through your orchard, you would certainly see this. Um, and so that you see this white kind of woolly um, mass. And this is actually a waxy secretion that's produced by the aphids themselves. So if you were to scrape this away, the aphids are actually there. But this white stuff is really easy to see um, compared to the small aphid. You can also look for cast skins, which are not pictured here but also liquid um, insect waste or the honeydew. And that's why I have this leaf here circled. You can actually see um, when John took this photo, you know, the honeydew actually reflects the flash from the camera. There's enough liquid from these, weight, from these insects um, accumulating on the leaves that you can actually use that as a, as a sign. Another image I have here um, are, is San Jose scale on apple. And here, this is on the, the stem. Um, and I say here that they're hiding in plain sight, but this is this depends right on your level of, of experience. Some of you would see this and know immediately it's San Jose scale. For others, maybe um, you'd see this and think, oh, you know, the stem looks a little dark, but and it wouldn't be until you look closer that you would see these are actually individual scales. And so um, just an example here of insects, quote, uh, hiding in plain sight. Um, so signs of insects on the fruit. Um, the key one I would say that is most useful, or I would say easily spotted are, it's always the poop. Where's the poop, as I like to ask? And this is, of course, the frass or the solid waste um, that can be on the inside of the fruit. So this is a, um, a peach that was cut open. And I know there was a plum curculio larva, which is a beetle larva inside. You can see all this dark coloring. Um, this is where the insect has been feeding and, of course, pooping. Um, it's really nasty. Um, Another kind of diagnostic uh, sign of insects, particularly on apples, is coddling moth um, frass. So this is basically where the caterpillar grows in, it's feeding, and of course, as it poops, it just pushes that the, the frass or the waste out um, of the same tunnel that it's feeding in onto the surface of the fruit. So if you're walking along and you see these kind of um, on the external part of the fruit, kind of, a, I would call it kind of like dirt or coffee ground-like textured um, frass, um, you know that you have um, likely have an insect um, inside feeding, even though it itself is not visible. So now I want to talk about symptoms of damage, and I have many, many more images um, of the symptoms as opposed to the actual signs, because um, it may be the case that you don't actually ever see the insect um, that, that does the damage. And of course, that's for many reasons. Some of them are pretty cryptic. They're well camouflaged. Maybe they're only coming out at night. But we also recognize that you're all very busy. So you're doing lots of things, trying to manage an orchard. You're not necessarily out there looking for insects for fun. <laughs> so um, European red mite um, is, a, is a common mite on apples that um, many of you probably have managed under or under control uh, with your oils, your dormant oils. Um, but if you do have an outbreak, you know, you can start to see these, um, these apple, the foliage, the leaves kind of looking bronze or bronze-ish or bronzing uh, caused by their feeding. And this is because they're scraping the, the leaf surface as they're collecting the liquids from um, the cells of the leaf. And so they're just not able to uh, collect the sunlight and, and uh, photosynthesize the way other leaves would. So they don't look as green. So this is gonna be a very, um, well, a diagnostic symptom that something is feeding on these leaves and that you have a problem. Another example um, is leaf curling. Um, in this case on apple caused by the rosy apple aphid. So um, depending on the timing, you could go um, see these leaves curling and if you uncurl them, you would actually see the aphids themselves, but it could also be that the aphids are long gone. And so you come and by the time you see these leaves curled up, you unroll them and there's nothing there. So it seems like, you know, what happened? You know, was, was this the cause of something else? Um, so 
Uh, I'll just mention that rosy apple aphid um, is one of the key aphids that causes this type of leaf rolling damage because they actually do inject a toxin into the plant when they're feeding. So, and that toxin is what causes this um, distortion of the leaves. Next, uh, we have um, an example of terminal shoot damage. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better picture um, so to, to zoom in on, but this is damage caused by the oriental fruit moth caterpillar. The adult's a tiny little drab moth that you may never see. Um, it's not particularly interesting to look at. Um, the early instars are the smallest caterpillar stage. Um, they hatch from an egg and they burrow into the terminal shoots because this is where the active growth is happening and all the delicious nutrients are there. So they're feeding and causing this dieback. Um, and sometimes you can see some kind of nastiness or browning um, as a result of like disease that comes in after the insect has burrowed. But usually seeing this at the terminal ends of the stems um, is diagnostic for um, a diagnostic symptom of oriental fruit moth um, caterpillar damage. Next, um, everyone's favorite insect, not really though, the Japanese beetle. Um, they have this very characteristic skeletonization feeding damage. So um, I'm kind of giving it away here because the insects are actually present. But um, if they weren't there, you could definitely follow up and see this um, skeletonized kind of pattern of feeding on the leaves. And I should mention that um, Japanese beetle adults um, will feed on the fruits. Um, I'm familiar in a couple of cases of them feeding on peaches. Um, I don't know that I've talked with anybody where they've had Japanese beetles feeding on the apples, but just to point out that they, they will do it. Um, not sure what, what changes their mind, except that peaches are delicious. Next, I wanna point out some, um, a different type of damage um, and very diagnostic of a certain type of insect on, on apple in this case. These kind of half moon, or um, some people like to call them like a thumbnail kind of uh, puncture damage on, on young fruits. This is diagnostic of um, the plum curculio. This is another of those snout weevils. Um, the adults come and feed on, um, they may be feeding on the actual fruit, but it's this diagnostic kind of um, thumbnail damage that indicates the female has tried to lay an egg inside, um, inside the fruit and um, that's what's caused the scarring and damage. I just realized maybe you can't see my, my laser pointer. So let me just make that red. Okay, so this is, sorry, uh, at this point on slide 16. Um, this is the, um, the damage I'm talking about for the egg scar. And then some of this other kind of damage is just maybe the female feeding and biting, but the egg scar is um, actually her pushing her ovipositor into the fruit and laying an egg. Um, another kind of, I would say challenging uh, kind of damage to point out or symptoms on fruit are caused by those piercing sucking insects. So in this case, brown marmorated stink bug feeding. So you can see there's these little depressions um, in the apples um, and you can kind of see the spots that are discolored from where these insects have stabbed their mouth parts, their needle like mouth parts in there to, to sip the juice. So um, you can see some of this kind of damage um, caused by um, aphids feeding on the fruit. Um, I'm not sure it's as common, but just to point out that, you know, when you see this kind of damage again on the fruit, clearly not open wounds. So it's helpful to at least see this and be able to identify this is likely caused by an insect with um, a straw-like mouth part uh, rather than chewing mouth parts. Um, some other symptoms that you've likely seen um, is kind of the scarring and oozing um, of fruits. These are peaches, immature peaches, obviously, that have been attacked by oriental fruit moth caterpillars. So they're, um, they can go in, they're inside these, these peaches feeding and causing these, these horrible scars. Um, and even if they drop out or they don't continue feeding, the injury by, caused by them entering can cause this oozing, um, oozing fluid. And typically this is um, oriental fruit moth on peaches and apples in our region, um, not, not other caterpillars like the coddling moth, which I think I have on the next slide, indeed. So um, the classic worm in the apple um, is the coddling moth. And so this is another case where I have um, signs and symptoms present in, in this image. So here we actually see the caterpillar um, feeding and it's entered through um, the top part of the plant here where the stem was burrowing in and feeding um, on the fruit. And so um, the symptom, of course, if you were to cut this open, is the tunnel, the presence of the tunnel, but we also see um, signs here too, in this case, lots of frass, and I mentioned before, this is very diagnostic 
um, for the codling moth as it tunnels into apples because they just eat a lot. And so they, they produce a lot of frass that will build up in the tunnel and sometimes on the, um, the surface or the entry to the actual, um, the tunnel, I guess, where they entered. Um, another image I wanted to show um, is damage caused by the apple maggot, which for my understanding is extremely, well, I don't want to say extremely, seems to be very rare in our region. I've yet to talk to anybody who says, has said that they, they have any issues with um, apple maggot. And if you do, I'd love to know so we can come get some samples and take some pictures and maybe put up a trap. <laughs> so um, this is an interesting insect because it's a, um, a, a larger kind of house fly sized uh, fly. And the adult comes and lays eggs on the outside of the fruit. Um, and that's what causes these kind of dimpling um, stings, um, as they're called. But if you were to cut this fruit open, um, even, after even after the larvae are gone, this looks kind of interesting. It looks like an apple, in my opinion, that's been sliced open and kind of has been sitting a little bit um, and is allowed to turn a little brown. But of course, if you take this from the tree, um, immediately slice it open and see this damage, um, this is really diagnostic for um, a diagnostic symptom of apple maggot uh, damage because you don't see clear tunnels through here. Instead, um, you just see the kind of browning, which has occurred because the maggots are moving through and actually drinking the juices from the fruit, not actually chewing on, on the, I guess it's the pulp um, of the fruit itself. So this is pretty interesting damage. That is definitely apple maggot if you ever see it. So um, kind of getting close to wrapping up here um, in terms of showing you pictures, I now have just a couple of slides to highlight some diagnostic features of the culprit. So um, I always think of my sister and friends who are totally disgusted by insects when I put these types of slides together. So, um, you know, let's say you have a fruit and there's something in there and you're like, oh, geez, is this a caterpillar? Is it a beetle larva? Is it a maggot? What is it? I'm disgusted. Just help me because I don't even want to look at it. So here are some key tips that um, I want to share that I think would be helpful. And these are the exact approaches that I would use when uh, I receive a, a specimen or a fruit, a sample. So caterpillars, um, these are typically pretty obvious. Most of us have seen a caterpillar. Um, many of us call them worms, but I have to say they are not insects because worms don't have legs. So the caterpillars, um, as you see pictured here, have legs um, on the front uh, and the end of the body. And so it's a little hard to see in this picture, but this is the best one I could get that had fruit um, as a focus. So just here, you can see there's one, two, three legs here. And so there's um, six in total if you count on both sides of the body. These are the main legs that are always gonna be present if it's a caterpillar. And you're also gonna see these little stubby lumps in the back. And these are a different type of leg that the caterpillar uses for gripping. Um, these are called pro legs, but if it's a caterpillar, it will have a clear head capsule. It's gonna have these legs in the front and these little grippy legs in the middle to end of the body. They also produce a lot of frass, as I love to talk about. Lots of poop, it's likely a caterpillar. So you may see something else though. You may cut open a plum in this case and see this little guy. And this is a beetle larva. And you can probably see where it would be possible to uh, confuse this beetle larva with a caterpillar because they look similar in that they have a worm-like body and it has a clear head capsule. This is the head, there's the bum. However, the difference between the beetle larvae and the caterpillars, beetle larvae may be totally legless, um, as in the picture of, um, or as pictured here, this is the larval stage of plum curculio, that weevil or snout beetle that I've um, mentioned before. So here, if you look at the front of the body, there are no legs whatsoever. Instead, there's these little meaty lumps um, because they're super fatty as larvae, which I think makes them super cute, but I may be the only one who thinks that. If you look at the end of the body, there are no legs. Um, the frass is not often as obvious in terms of the quantity because this is a smaller larval stage. But the key, so the key thing to look for here is if it has a head capsule and it's legless, it's a beetle larva of some kind. Last but not least, everyone's favorite disgusting insect, the maggots, which are um, the larval stage of flies. So an easy way, this is grape, um, picture of a grape here. So maggots are gonna be much, much smaller than caterpillars or beetle larvae, that, that's probably obvious to, to many of you. And they're gonna be completely legless and lack an, an obvious head capsule. So I always like to say, if you can't tell the head from the bum, it's a maggot because it just looks like it's a wormy thing that 
you know, is nasty looking and has no other really distinctive features. So um, with these kind of tips, I think generally speaking, when you are looking at particular pest specimens that may be in the fruit, um, these are the, the groups that you're going to see, caterpillars, beetle larvae, or maggots. So I showed those pictures kind of quickly, so I just wanted to put them side by side on, a, on one slide. And so again, um, with the caterpillar and the beetle larvae both having a clear head capsule, you can tell which side's the head and which side's the bum, except the caterpillar is going to have legs. Um, always going to have legs and pro legs. The beetle larvae may have legs in the front, but no legs in the back. And then of course the maggot being the one that you really can't tell the head from the bum. So it's a maggot. <laughs> so now I want to get into the helpful resources and hopefully I'm not going over my time here. Um, Lace, you can unmute and let me know. Um, so just a few things. Um, so scouting tips and monitoring tools. These are Excellent. Uh, there are so many more options for the, uh, well, not so many, but a lot of options for um, folks who have uh, orchards and, and produce tree fruit because um, it's so valuable. Everybody loves fruits. A lot of research has gone into developing monitoring tools and traps for these insects. So the first thing you want to do if you're not doing it already is to scout your orchard regularly for the signs and symptoms. And I just showed you a few examples of pictures previously. Um, in this in this presentation. So just walking through there with a cup of coffee or maybe a glass of wine, depending on time of day, um, or something stronger, um, just look for things that, that are out of the ordinary. And um, particularly for several of the insects, particularly the adult moths and the beetles, um, there are excellent monitoring traps you can use so that you don't have to go out there and actually try to find a needle in a haystack. Instead, these traps um, have some type of, of capture mechanism, in this case, a sticky trap, but they're also bucket traps if, if the sticky traps are too messy for you and you don't want to you know, handle them. So these traps have a pheromone and um, which attracts the males or the females or both to the traps. So you don't have to go looking for them. They'll come right where you can check once or twice a week. They may sometimes have a host plant odor mixed in with the pheromone to make that trap even more attractive. But you know what it boils down to is they come to the trap um, attracted to some delicious odor or romantic odor and they land in there and they die. And then all you have to do is go get the trap, look inside and be able to say, um, you know, this is a moth or a beetle or um, some of you likely are very good at identifying the particular culprit. So I just have here in this picture, coddling moth here and oriental fruit moth, um, very drab moths that don't seem that interesting, except we know they can be very damaging um, in tree fruit. The other thing I wanna mention and um, kind of following up on what Janet emphasized in her presentation is um, the use of degree days or yeah, the use of degree days to help you track activity of insects and the, the particular, in particular, the damaging life stages of insects. So um, some people may find degree days very intimidating and don't really know what they mean because a lot of people talk about them and aren't necessarily very good at explaining what they, how they work or what they do. And so I just want to briefly say here that degree days are so useful because insect development is temperature dependent. And many of you probably know that. So the warmer it is, the faster the insects develop, the more likely um, or the, the greater number of generations they can complete in a given period of time, let's say a growing season. And when it's cooler, things slow down. And so if you're used to, used to using a calendar and going out in spring, you know, every week at this time, you may not be timing your, um, your, your sprays or what other, whatever kind of management strategy you have to target the insect uh, before it lays the eggs, before it burrows into the fruit, um, and even which uh, life stage is most important for you to manage. So using degree days really allows um, you to, to tune in to the insect's development. Um, and I guess I should say, this is what I wanted to follow up from Jana's presentation. As you know, our climate um, early springs get more and more variable. Um, I was calling them crazy springs, you know, the, the cold temperatures, the rains, um, the long springs, you know, those, those things make it really hard to time uh, management activities against these insects. But if you are tracking degree days, you're gonna be uh, better able to time your action against the pest because these insects can't change when they're developing. Um, they can't hide, well, they can hide or run from you or me, hide or run, I sh should say, but they can't outrun um, their, their basic developmental biology, which is tied directly to temperature. So just a couple of management um, 
tools or resources I wanted to share that many of you likely are aware of. If you have a sample and you're not sure what it is, it could be leaves, it could be the insect itself, um, it could be pictures, please feel free to submit those to uh, the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. And I have a, um, a link here so you can submit a sample. And um, this is just a screenshot of the website for what that would look like. And uh, I always like to say here, please keep in mind if you send an insect sample, especially, um, well, I should say whether it's a hard bodied beetle or a soft caterpillar, please put it inside something like a tube or an old pill container, you know, remove your personal information, but just so that it makes it to us without getting busted to pieces in the mail because that happens a lot. Um, I just also wanna follow up on some resources available from the university. Um, Edu extension or education store. Jana's already referred to the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. Um, I've got my hard copy here. Hopefully um, you have yours as well, but there are also digital downloads available for free. And these are PDF documents that you can search using your computer. I also just wanted to mention this um, fruit insect uh, bulletin that I produced um, last year, and it has way more in-depth information about the groups of insects I mentioned today that are common uh, insect pests and in tree fruit. So it talks about some management strategies, um, cultural strategies, um, and, and other things to consider in, in management. So with that, um, I just want to summarize, I hope from, from this presentation, I've given you a sense or um, some confidence in knowing what the key signs and symptoms are of insects and where to look. Um, I won't name these, but um, hopefully you got a, you're picking up what I'm putting down from this presentation. Um, you know, please scout, use the monitoring tools and consider cultural strategies um, like sanitation, as Jana mentioned. Um, this is really, really important. It's going to reduce favorable habitat for the insects. You may even be eliminating alternative hosts or food sources and also the buildup of, of pest populations in your orchard. So this is really, really critical, even though I didn't emphasize it today. And just coming back to, you know, um, the big picture of this presentation, all these pictures, all, you know, um, these symptoms and signs, what's the big deal? Well, the goal is really to help you um, know how to identify the insect or at least know what to look for so we can help you identify it. And this is going to help you choose the correct tool, whether it's a monitoring trap, um, insecticides, or, or what, whatever it may be to manage this pest um, or this insect in your orchard before it blows up and becomes a huge problem. So with that, um, I have a second poll question here. Um, this is just a way for me to assess um, how well uh, I hit the mark with this presentation. I know we're going to have a listening session later, and I'm looking forward to that, to, to hearing more about what the actual problems are um, that you are seeing in your orchards insect-wise. And um, so that poll can, run, conti can continue to run, but I just wanted to put up my information here. If you want to contact me um, by email, here's my email address, my lab website. We do have uh, I maintain a Twitter account in the more so in the summer to try to keep people updated on, on what we're seeing. Um, we also have a fruit um, and vegetable insect Facebook page. So um, we always want people to post more pictures there, but no one really does. So um, that's a resource that's available to you that we're tracking. And with that, I will um, stop here. And if there is time, I'm happy to take a question or two, or um, we can move on and I'll answer the questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. Dr. Myers is from the Horticulture and Landscape Architecture Department, and you're the Assistant Professor of Weed Science. Is that right, Dr. Myers? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Fantastic. Okay. It's good to be with you today. Um, yeah. Wow. Jana and Elizabeth, I've learned a lot in those first two talks. I hope we can keep the momentum going here with the weed science part. Um, so an outline of what I plan to cover today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about weed biology, particularly of Canada thistle and two of the dock species, uh, kind of inspired again by what the entomology and pathology folks do, give you some background on a particular weed species uh, and then some insight into how we might manage it. We'll talk a little bit about herbicide resistance. It's not something we think about a lot in fruit uh, crops, but I think something we need to be aware of and that will affect us at some point. Then we'll cover a couple just really general concepts about weed management in perennial fruits and then provide a couple herbicide updates. All right. So the first weed I want to talk to you a little bit about, I get a number of questions about Canada thistle every year in various fruit crops. And, and this is a photo of what the flowers look like. Um, it's distributed really across a lot of the United States and into Canada, of course. The limiting factor here is that it does not like to grow where summer temperatures frequently exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, so you can see for the most part, that's going to be the, the southeastern states there. It is a member of the sunflower family, so it has that composite flower. It's a perennial weed. It reproduces by seeds and roots, which are going to be important facts when we talk about how to manage it. And it tends to appear in large circular patches with a common or shared root system. The flowers are usually lavender, but they can be white and flowering is triggered by long days. So it's gonna flower pretty consistently the same time of year from year in and year out. Um, plants produce either male or female flowers and female plants can produce 40 to 80 seeds per head with about 5,000 seeds per plant per year, which is pretty prolific. Now each of the seeds will have a pappus, which we, we might use the slang term parachute and so this would be similar to dandelions, for example, if you see a white puffy dandelion uh, and you, you, know, you blow the seeds out from the, the seed head and they fly away, uh, the, the concept is, is really similar here. The, the fortunate thing for us is that for the most part, the, the seed will stay on the seed head of Canada thistle and the pappus will fly away seedless. It doesn't always happen. If, uh, if, if the situation is set up where the seed actually detaches from the seed head with the pappus or with the parachute, it could travel up to half a mile from, from its origin. Uh, seeds can also be spread by water within crop seed if you have contaminated crop seed and hay, and they can germinate the same season or remain dormant for up to 20 years. They can also germinate from a range of depths, so anywhere from zero to three inches. So the Canada thistle that germinates from seed will look like the photos on the right. So the top photo is a photo of the cotyledons or the seed leaves. You can see they're oblong and fleshy. And then the bottom photo would show you what a couple of the true leaves look like. Now it's important to note that when Canada thistle has approximately four true leaves, somewhere between 20 and 30 days after it's germinated, it is able to produce lateral roots with buds which brings us to the second way that Canada thistle reproduces itself by asexual reproduction. So in one season, Canada thistle roots can spread nine to 18 feet laterally and uh, six to nine feet deep. So this is not a plant that we can, once it's established, pull up or, or cultivate away. The root fragments as small as one inch can survive and produce a new plant. So the photos on the screen, the top one there, shows you a root fragment that's maybe a couple inches in length and it's got about four different sprouts coming off of that segment of root. And then the bottom photo gives you an idea of what um, an emerging Canada thistle from, from roots looks like as compared to one that's from a uh, seed. All right, this is taken from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and it's uh, just a an infographic of what the life cycle of Canada thistle looks like. So if you look at the top photo, that would give us an idea of the life cycle in the first year. So if the seed were deposited in the summer, uh, you would get to the next spring, it would, it would germinate. It would actually form a rosette and flower. You start bolting in early summer and it would be able to set viable seed um, by the, the middle of summer. And after flowering, the, you know, the, the fluorescence kind of dies back. And in the fall, they'll, uh, they'll actually put out a second rosette or, or kind of basal leaves. And the purpose of that is to, to actually capture sunlight and put more resources, more carbohydrate into the roots so that it can then uh, sprout the next spring. The bottom photo shows you what an established plant looks like, the life cycle of an established plant essentially really similar, um, except the plants, of course, are larger, capable of producing more seed and have a more extensive root system. All right, moving on. So these are two dock species that, that we commonly see in various fruit production systems. Curly dock on the left, growing through plastic in a plastic culture strawberry system, and then broadleaf dock on the right. Again, these are both widely distributed throughout the US. Uh, as you can see indicated on the USDA plants uh, database maps on the screen. All right, a little biology. These are members of the smartweed or buckwheat family. Again, they're also perennial and reproduced by seeds and deep spreading roots. 
And just like the Canada thistle, they tend to appear in large patches, which you can see on the, the photo on the screen there. They're also very vigorous seed producers. So one plant can produce up to 40,000 seeds per plant per year, and they can be viable and germinable or able to germinate the same season that they're produced. The other important thing to note here is that some of the research from the early 70s indicates that once one of these docks germinates and starts growing, if, if it gets to about day 30, under certain scenarios, it is actually able to, uh, to re-sprout if all the top growth is, is removed. And so you can see that data also presented on the screen there. And certainly, you know, once they get to 47 days after seeding, for example, uh, all of the individuals are able to re-sprout once the, the top growth is removed. All right, so just some general management practices for these weeds. Uh, we don't use a lot of mulch in perennial fruits, but occasionally we do. For perennial weeds like these, they're going to be pretty ineffective. So when we think about the, the benefits of mulch, they're really good for helping us to stop weeds from seed because they block light. And for some weed seeds, that means they won't germinate. And then for other weed seeds, they just they can't get through that plastic layer by the time they've run out of resources from the seed um, and they essentially starve. That's not gonna be the case here for our Canada thistle and our docks. And you can see that um, photos of both on the screen, having no trouble making it through plastic mulch. Mowing can be an, an effective method, but it's not a stand, standalone method. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about mowing, the main objectives are really kind of twofold. One is to prevent uh, viable seed production. So if we were to do this with Canada thistle, for example, we would want to target the bud stage. We would allow the plant to put a lot of its carbohydrate or resources into reproduction and then remove that top growth as much as we can um, before it flowers. The reason for that is because within eight to 10 days after flowering of a Canada thistle flower, uh, it can have viable seeds. So we want to get to it before that point. All right, cultivation. Now, again, in perennial fruits, we're not going to use cultivation a lot. We could maybe use it during the establishment phase. It will be effective against some of our younger seedlings of uh, docks and thistles and other things. Again, we got to target them before they are able to regenerate themselves from roots. Um, they, it can be effective against them. Some perennial weeds, for example, dandelion. However, one of the things we need to be aware of is that especially with established docks in Canada thistle, if we cultivate them, we tend to cut up the root fragments and actually distribute or plant them uh, throughout our field. So that's something to be mindful of. The other thing that can happen is if, if we plan to use a systemic herbicide, um, a cultivation event prior to that could be disruptive. Again, the Canada thistle has a shared root system. And so by running cultivation equipment through before we spray, essentially you're, you're uh, disrupting that root system. All right, hand weeding is not something we really like to get into. I think it's mainly effective or best used when we're targeting escaped weeds or if we're in a part of the growing season where we would be too close to harvest to apply a herbicide. Um, those are really the best options. If you do hand remove weeds like this, you want to try to get as much of it as you can and then dispose of the weed parts uh, away from the field. So if, uh, if if your trash company will let you throw it in the dumpster, do that or throw it in the burn pile. Um, just do what you can to make sure that it doesn't stay in the field. There is some biological control. Some of this is predispersal. So there are flies and different things that'll feed on the seeds before they drop. But once they do get dispersed, beetles, crickets, small rodents, and birds can be effective at, at eating them. There's some data that shows that 42 to 59% of Canada thistle seeds are actually consumed within seven days after they're dispersed, mostly by non-bird predators. All right, if we wanna talk about herbicides, um, there are some efficacy tables. This one is pulled from the Michigan State um, Fruit Guide given to me by Dr. Chidari there. But for example, we've highlighted Canada thistle in that vertical 
column. And you'll notice that there are no pre-emergence herbicides or soil applied herbicides that have good efficacy against Canada thistle. What you will notice is four herbicides that have good post-emergence. So Quinstar, Roundup, Stinger, and 2,4-D. So three of these are auxinic herbicides, and then one is glyphosate. Just to show you what this looks like here. So we do have options, but it's, there's not a, not a ton of options. All right, just to give you an example that herbicides can be potentially useful in our weed management systems. This is taken from a perennial strawberry production site. The photo on the left did not have a post-harvest stinger application made the previous growing season, and the photo on the right did. So you can see what difference that makes. A single application made post-harvest in the previous growing season. All right, we'll move on. I'm going to talk about herbicide resistance. Again, this is not something we see a lot in perennial fruit crops, but it's something we need to be aware of. Um, what you'll see on the screen here, this comes from weedscience.org, and you're, it's open to the public to go to this website and take a look at it. You can see these same graphs. But this is really since 1975 or so to about 2021 when this data was pulled, there's a linear increase in the number of unique cases of herbicides, herbicide resistant weeds globally. Um, that's, that's a pretty stark graphic right there. Now, what we, what we see also is that there's a lot of diversity in the type of herbicide or the class of herbicide that have resistance. The most herbicide resistance is observed in our ALS herbicides. They've been around longer. Uh, so weeds have had a longer chance to get, to get resistant to them, uh, followed by the triazines, and if you look, for example, ACCA's inhibitors of bare grass selective and uh, herbicides, it's kind of leveling off there. The blue um, circles, the blue line is glycine. So that would be our, our roundup. And you can see it's, it's almost on a linear trajectory as well from about the year 2000. The other scary thing is that there are weed species now with multiple herbicide resistance. So they're not just resistant to glyphosate or, or atrazine, they're resistant to multiple herbicides. And so that's what this is showing. So two-way two, two -way resistance, three-way resistance. Uh, we even have some pigweed now with, with five-way resistance to various modes of action of herbicide. And this is essentially documenting the same thing. The fact that there are now weed species with multiple resistance to two, three, four, five different herbicides. All right, if we look at the number of herbicide resistant species by cropping system, again, orchards is at the bottom of this list. Wheat, corn, rice, soybean have the most. Um, so, you know, why are we talking about this? Well, if we look at the herbicides that have the most resistant weed species. Some of them get used uh, in our, our perennial fruit crops. So glyphosate, paraquat, simazine, 2,4-D, for example, uh, are all in the top of this list, the top 15. The other way to think about this is that a lot of the weed species with the most herbicide resistance are commonly found in fruit production systems as well. So the two um, lolium species there would be ryegrass. We have barnyard grass, annual bluegrass. Um, let's see, wild oats, goosegrass, pigweeds, common ragweed, and then Canada um, fleabane, or what we might call mare's tail or horseweed, depending on what part of the state you live in. The photo on the right is actually a photo of that Caniza canadensis or mare's tail. And you can see that it's been sprayed with glyphosate and everything around it is dead uh, and it's still green and growing. So if we wanna look at specific documented herbicide resistance in fruit production systems, that is also available on this weeds.org website. And you can see again, glyphosate resistance, um, paraquat glufosinate resistance as well, some cethoxidem resistance, which is one of our grass herbicides, atrazine, simazine, diuron as well. So, um, yeah. The other unfortunate bit of news, I guess, is that if we're 
waiting for new herbicides to help us out. That's kind of a, a, (laughs) I don't know, a futile task, I guess, or a futile effort. So Jana did a good job. I think it was last year of putting together a, uh, a newsletter article about the IR4 project and how it fits into registrations of pesticides for minor use crops. These are the 2021 efforts for IR4 for the weed science component. And so you can see on the screen, the new tolerances that were established in 2021. So this would be pesticide residue tolerances. Uh, for clopyrrolid, we got cane berries in there. But if you look through these lists of crops, there's not a lot of perennial fruits and not a lot of temperate perennial fruits that appear. This would be um, you know, decisions that are kind of in process. So we've got glufosinate in a number of crops, uh, ethoflurylin, but really no, no fruit crops there. Uh, pronamide, we see palm fruits, stone fruits, caneberry fruits. So this may be one that, that we have an option of using in the future. And then efforts that are underway right now. Um, let's see trying to oh okay so these these are ones these are additional yeah herbicides here but again you see a lot of tropical crops um a lot of vegetable crops not a ton of perennial temperate fruits that are being investigated by ir4 right now for the herbicide component um current projects with ir4 on the weed science front there is 24d research going on with caneberry and strawberry uh you see a blueberry project that's about it. So if we're waiting on new registrations or label expansions to help us out with our uh, potential herbicide resistance issues, it's, it's kind of a losing effort. All right. So with that said, we've got one, one poll question for you for this presentation, which is just to try to gauge for, for you on your farm, have you noticed reduced weed control from once effective herbicides? So do you suspect herbicide resistance on your farm. Looks like we're, we're sticking around about two thirds. Yes. And, and one third no. So that's, that's interesting. So, um, you feel free to, to keep filling out that poll and then we'll move on. But that's, that's really good to know. I, I would say that if you do suspect, um, you know, herbicide resistance that, that that's one thing we can, we can try to help you identify, you know, if that's, if that's the case. Um, some of the things we want to try to do to mitigate the or slow herbicide resistance, utilizing integrated weed management. So not just focusing on herbicides, but also incorporating cultural, mechanical, and biological control, rotating herbicide mode of actions. So, or modes of action. So looking at the group number on the label. So we've got HRAC and WSSA uh, group codes that, that it should appear on all the herbicide labels. And what you want to do is make sure that you try to rotate these. So you don't want to spray all group 14 herbicides year after year and, and um, you know, season after season. The other thing that we can do is, is incorporate pre-emergence herbicides. So a lot of the resistance that we see is to herbicides that are applied to emerged weeds. And so right now we're not seeing as much to, to weeds that are applied with uh, or sprayed with herbicide pre-emergence. Okay, so our, uh, our soybean and corn uh, counterparts have some good information on mode of action and um, mitigating herbicide resistance. And so if you go to this Take Action website, one of the things that, that you can utilize is, is this list of uh, trade names and active ingredients for different groups of herbicide mode of action. So since we showed Chateau on the previous slide, this is a, an example of all the PPO herbicides, uh, both the products and then the active ingredients. So you can kind of determine if you're using herbicides that have the same mode of action over and over again. All right, move on to some general concepts. Um, one of the things that Dr. Hurst mentioned in his talk last week was the importance of managing weeds early on, right? So one of the things that we can do to help ourselves out is to, if we know we have um, a field with a history, especially perennial weed pressure, is to try to manage that before we plant. There's a lot more options available to us without a crop 
in the ground um, than once we've got one in the ground, especially when you think about the limitations for herbicides that, that can't be applied to newly planted trees, for example. Um, so I'm going to document this with an example from wine grape. So this graph here shows vine cross-sectional area. And what Mitchum et al. did was they planted grapevines and then they kept them weed free for zero, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, and 24 weeks after planting. And essentially what you'll see is that when they get to about 12 weeks or so, this cross-sectional area levels off. So there's an advantage to keeping the crop weed free, at least for the first 12 weeks in this case. And so this is what it looks like um, when we look at photos. So the top left photo there would be zero weeks weed free. The top right would be four weeks weed free, eight and 12. And you can see the difference that maintaining, um, you know, that vegetation weed free strip around the row weed free for longer has on, on the growth of the crop in that first year. All right, the other thing we need to be mindful of is, you know, yeah, stay clean or start clean, but also try to stay clean. And so one of the things we need to be mindful of is, is how weed seeds persist in our soils. And so this is a graphic of that. The white arrows would indicate weeds that are kind of coming out of the system, either through germination or decay or predation. And then the black arrows would indicate how seeds are moving into the system. And so one of the ways, of course, is is seed rain. So uh, seeds actually come off of weeds in our fields. And the other is seed dispersal. So moving or introducing weed seeds into our systems or our fields uh, from, from outside of that system. So some of the things that we can do to manage these different aspects with emerging weeds, we can use herbicides. There are some of my colleagues investigating alternatives such as flaming or electric electrocution or steam or grit, a number of different methods uh, to try to manage weeds that are either emerged or before they emerge. As far as managing seed dispersal as an input to our seed bank, sanitation and exclusion are really important here. It's not something that's very glamorous, but it, it is really important to not introduce weeds if we can avoid it. The photo on the right, of course, shows a bush hog that's covered in a plant chaff there from, from mowing. If you were to take that to a, um, a relatively weed-free field and run it through, uh, I'm sure it would deposit some weeds or introduce some weeds to that system. Decay, options in our perennial fruits are really limited for promoting decay. In uh, some of our annual vegetable production systems, this might be something like using inversion tillage or, or some other methods, but we don't have a lot of options when it comes to promoting decay in perennial fruits. Um, we do have a little bit as far as predation goes, of course, in our fruit systems, bird and mouse or mice are four letter words. So it's kind of a um, not all positive relationship there if we, if we want to encourage those to predate on our weed seeds. But uh, if we can certainly encourage or provide a habitat for insect granivores, that would be beneficial. All right move on to some herbicide updates. And I'm sure there are tons, but the two that I've heard the most about are a new formulation of Stinger. So Stinger HL, the HL either stands for high load or higher load, depending on who you talk to. But this is a five pound uh, per gallon formulation as opposed to the three pound formulation. Um, right now, the only labeled uses for the crops that we typically think of are perennial strawberry and sweet corn. So the, the Stinger label itself is far more um, inclusive right now than the Stinger HL label. I've got a, a email out to my contact with Corteva to see what the status is on that. The other thing you may have seen already is that Chateau and Valor, so the flumioxazin formulations from Valent, are moving to an EZ formulation. So this is now a liquid instead of a granular. The EZ is, uh, is, is supposed to tell us that when you do your calculations, it'll be easy to figure out because if you had used three um, granular ounces of product, you can now use three fluid ounces of product and put the same amount of active out across an acre. All right. I haven't been able to see the chat, but I'll look in there and see um, 
if there's anything for me to answer. In the meantime, I may have time for questions or we could roll right into the, uh, the dialogue part. Thank you, Dr. Myers. There was a couple questions in the chat. Um, someone especially wants to know how to spray without getting drift on their fruit trees. Okay. What's the best way? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so one of the things we need to be mindful of, well, there's a lot. So, um, so one of the things that really helps us out is droplet size. So of course, the larger our droplet, the, the less that it will drift. And so we have more advanced nozzle types now, um, that produce consistently larger droplets and fewer fine droplets, which is really the key because those fine dr droplets are the ones that get carried away in, in our wind. Um, the other thing to be mindful of is, um, is solo, um, not so um, air inversion events. So that's, that's something that I've seen with uh, Chateau, for example, if you spray it, direct it below the canopy, um, you know, you can actually get an inversion event and you see Chateau damage from, from it kind of dripping up in the canopy, which uh, just seems wild, but, um, that may be, a that's, that's its whole, a whole nother topic, I guess. But, um, yeah, those are, are two, two main ways, managing droplet size, not spraying when it's windy, those kinds of things. Thank you so much. Those were, that was the one question you kind of answered the other question. Someone asked about burning weeds. It sounds like people are doing research on that the fire control. Yeah. So there's, there's some, yeah, research being done with flaming, uh, electrocution, so yeah, lots of interesting stuff going on in weed science. Sounds like now's our listening session and we have Dr. Beckerman, Dr. Long and Dr. Myers here. I have a, I have a question. Can you hear Before, me? We hear you, yes. Okay, uh, well, we just, I just got notification from American Fruit Grower that um, the EPA has taken off a number of uh, uh, you can't use them anymore. A number of fungicides, including Zyram, Thyram, there are some other ones. But, uh, and I don't know if, if you have Zyram still, if you've carried it over from a previous year and have some extra, I don't know if you're allowed to use that or not, but I don't think you can go out and buy it anymore. That's my understanding. Uh, I don't have a, or let's see, maybe I can find it here, um, but it was kind of scary. Um, there were some that, that we don't use in the orchard, but Thyram, yeah, some people still use Thyram on, but uh, Zyram for sure. And then uh, Warhawk or what, what is the, um, yeah, so, so Warhawk. Sarah, Sarah? Yes. Um, they haven't banned the use or anything, and I put the link in there. Right now, it's going up for a re registration decision. Oh, okay. So it's really important that I, I provided a link there to give everyone more information that they prepare a statement and put it in when they reopen the chat or. Um, email it to, there's several names there. Melanie Bisco is one. Um, somebody named Melissa uh, is another. I'm looking right now at it. Marissa, excuse me, Marissa Wright. All of these names are actually uh, on the link that I provided in the chat and I will copy and paste and put it in one more time. Um, That'd be so great. In, so important to make sure you get the, the word out um, and Without, if they don't hear from you that these products are needed and why they're needed, uh, decisions get made um, that will definitely negatively uh, affect the production for several of us, not just in uh, apples, but uh, small fruit as well. Well, what about, uh, where do we stand on Warhawk though? Uh, I forget the name of the active ingredient. Poparhoss, I think. Chlorpyrifos, uh, my understanding, and Elizabeth, jump in if I'm wrong, is they're all banned right now. Right. That's what I, that's my understanding. Correct. And that's, that's, that's sad for rosy apple aphid and aphids in general. And um, yeah. 
rosy apple aphid and, and uh, the uh, woolly apple aphid. Really good control with that. I stopped using it for a while and then I got a real good flush of uh, the woolly apple aphid again. So we'll be hurting there. Yeah, I can look into, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, Sarah, that um, I know some some of my colleagues that are continuing to do work in, in apples doing these efficacy trials and I can um, share those results with you. I, I don't know that any would be as good as clopyrifos, but at least we could, I could share what seems to work as well. And maybe some things have come to the top. Thank you, that would be great. Thank you. Tim had a question. Tim? Yeah, on the uh, topic of weed control, um, in the context of under tree uh, weed control, is there uh, any information about um, an optimal or a good range of gallons per acre? Um, questions coming from, I found when I increased my water, my gallons per acre with a different nozzle, I seem to get better kill and I'm following the directions, but wanted to know if um, there's a kind of an optimal range and then what kind of droplet size for that close to ground spraying works well. So what, what have you had success with? What, what output? Uh, I started with 25 and then I went to 35 and that seemed to do better. Um, and I'm using a, uh, like a medium to fine spray and I'm running about 40 PSI. Okay. Yeah. I, so I think for most of our herbicides, kind of a, a medium to coarse droplet size is, is good. Um, some of, some of the effect is going to be different based on if it's a contact herbicide versus a systemic. Um, if it's a contact herbicide, we, so something like glufosinate or, or Paraquat, for example, um, we need it to stay on the leaf long enough um, and enough of the leaf surface that we get good uptake that it doesn't just evaporate. Um, but yeah, so, so I don't know, higher volume for something like that is really optimal for our systemic herbicides. I think the, the output or the, the volume is going to be less important to some extent. Um, for those we need, we need a large enough droplet on the leaf surface that, that again, it doesn't evaporate before it can get taken into the leaf of our target species. Right. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question or, or if maybe it just kind of confirms, um, some of what you've already suspected. So when, when you've, when you've seen increase, um, output or volume, having a positive effect on your, your efficacy or your weed control, is that with a, a contact herbicide or is that with some of your systemic products? Uh, yeah, the contact, um, yeah. the way I kind of, la uh, my logic was that if I have more fluid, um, I had more covering the, uh, the plant and in the general area. And then I'm, you know, running both, uh, post and pre together in one, application okay. um and then i specifically uh or particularly with pre i also somewhere got the information that more liquid would be better than less um to get um the ground to to um i guess soak it in yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, more wouldn't hurt with the soil applied herbicides for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, with those act, you know, as long as we get the right kind of rainfall, um, you know, to spread it out across the top of that soil surface, you know, that that'd be great. But yeah, sometimes that doesn't happen. 
So the, what you can do, if, if you're able to have a higher output, you know, spread it across the surface a little bit more evenly yourself, that's probably beneficial. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering that. I know someone in the chat asked, I've been growing apples for a long time and never had any real issues with woolly ape, apple aphids, but the last two seasons, it seems to be a real issue. Do you see any reason for this increase? That is a great question. I am going to guess that, well, I'm wondering if it may have something to do with the trees being stressed. Um, and maybe ability to, I'm getting these confused with the, the other aphids. One of the aphids overwinters in, um, in the tree bark and kind of can hide in there. And the, the worse the trees get stressed, the better they do. So I'd have to actually look back at that bulletin that I put together. Um, but I would, if that person wants to email me, I'd love to be in touch and can follow up by email. Thank you, Dr. Long. Would you mind putting your email in your in the chat? Sure. Great. And I know someone else commented about how they run MIGs. They run around 40 GPA. They use those twin jet nozzles for pre and post. That's what they do. Um, I wanted to let you know that now we're going to have Jeff Burbrink. I hope that the professors will stay and answer any questions that might pop up in the chat, if that's okay, while people are still thinking about things while we're wrapping up to, at four. And so we're going to let Jeff Burbrink now come on. He's the educator up in Elkhart County, and he's going to talk about Drift Watch and why it's great for growers to register for it. It's a great tool. Thanks so much so far for everybody helping us. Hey, can you see my, can you see my uh, screen okay? Yep, it looks great. Wonderful. Um, I got a bit of a story to tell uh, here about Drift Watch. I'm a big believer in it because about uh, three years ago, we had a situation up here in Elkhart County where they had to spray a large amount of acreage uh, two years in a row for triple E, or that's equine encephalitis. And um, actually in 2020, we sprayed 375,000 acres across six counties up here in northern Indiana. Now, as you can imagine, uh, that had to include a lot of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we are, Elkhart County is a big fruit and vegetable county. So is LaGrange County. Uh, and a lot of our Amish farms up here were, um, were sprayed because of uh, eastern equine encephalitis, uh, trying to keep that knocked back. Uh, the other threat to uh, vegetables and fruit, of course, is some of the new herbicides, or I shouldn't say new herbicides, but they've been reinvented uh, herbicides, dicamba and 2,4-D. Uh, those things have a potential to drift, and it's a good idea to have um, uh, your, your uh, vegetables and your fruits in drift watch so that the farmers who are going to be spraying those products can find out where you are. Um, so there's, there's actually three different parts to, to, uh, field watch there's drift watch, which is where you as a specialty crop grower would register your farm. There's bee check. And many of you have bees on your farms. You may not own them, but maybe somebody else brings them to your place and sets them out. And then there's field check. And that is where the applicators go to look, to see if there's any, uh, any nearby specialty crops or bees where they're going to be spraying. Um, you know, why drift watch? Well, drift is expensive. I knew a guy that got his entire greenhouse wiped out a couple of years ago by dicamba and, uh, he got a pretty good sized check from the, from the, uh, applicators insurance company it still didn't cover all his costs though. Um, you know, a lot of what you grow is very expensive to put out and it's even more expensive if you lose it when it's getting really close to, um, uh, harvest. So uh, a lot of the aerial companies, a lot of the right-of-way companies have a policy that they use drift watch every time they go out to apply. I know the aerial applicator that applied for the triple E up here, you downloaded all the drift watch maps into his, into his planes that sprayed all those 375,000 acres in 2020. It's pretty easy to, to use. You get into uh, drift watch by creating an account and then you plot your fields and basically if you've ever seen google earth that's what you're using you draw a little square around your property 
and there uh, and that marks out your property. The only people that can register their their um, property on Drift Watch are commercial growers. Uh, we don't want backyard uh, people putting their vegetable gardens or backyard fruit trees in there. These have to be commercial growers, and the uh, the state chemist office, which manages uh, Drift Watch in our state. Uh, does keep an eye out for those kind of things when they are mapped. Uh, these pesticide applicators, according to the label on Dicamba, uh, they have to go to the website and check for, for um, specialty crop producers nearby. And, uh, you know, the applicator can also sign up to be notified when a new site pops up in their area. You can actually draw a little square around your um, your or the applicator can draw a little square around his property and if a new applicator or a new grower pops up in his area he'll get an email about that so uh this is what drift watch looked like in 2014 so that was about eight years ago and you see there's a lot of little gaps here around evansville and over uh benton county you know you could you could see the ground in indiana i want you to see what it looks like now people have really jumped on to uh, that, and you see where it's really dark up here in northern Indiana. Well, there, that's where I'm at. I'm on the the left side of that dark spot. Uh, Lagrange County would be the other part of that, and that's our Amish community for the most part. A lot of those people are organic growers, fruit growers, vegetable growers, and we got a lot of them. Uh, but that's how thick that map uh, has gotten. It's just a lot of people have registered now for for Drift Watch. Now here's a, this is a close up, and this is my county over here on on the left side, Middlebury, Bristol, Goshen, Indiana, Lagrange counties here, Shipshawana, Emma, Lagrange, Howe, and you see all those green dots right there. Those are pretty much all Amish farms that are organic or going to certified organic. The yellow things are bees. We've got some grapes here up near Bristol, a bunch of fruit and vegetables down here south of Goshen. Um, so that's how you map that out and, and you can click on each of these spots and it will give you information about that particular grower, in, including how to contact them. So this particular one I clicked on is Myron Miller. He's in uh, LaGrange County, got a Goshen address and it's got his telephone number. So if somebody was going to be spraying near Myron's place, they could call his telephone number and find out more information if they needed to. So that's the way it works. It's actually pretty simple. Now, notice one thing about Myron's address here. He is Amish. He's got this really weird uh, email address, and that's because if you don't have um, if you don't have access to the computer, like most of our Amish and Old Order Mennonites up here, we can create a fake email address, uh, which gets you into the system. Uh, you have to have an email address to get in there. Uh, I've actually changed the way I'm doing it now. I've set up a, a Gmail address and I put and I put uh, the same address on all my Amish people. And then when their when their map expires, like his expires here in March of 2022, I get an email about that guy's farm dropping out of um, of the uh, Drift Watch, and then I can get a hold of him and ask him, "Hey, are you still in Drift Watch? Do you need to renew it for?" 2022 and uh, actually i had a bunch of those come through last week i had about 27 of them come through last week that i needed to get a hold of um, it's real easy to sign up it's no different than signing up for managing your bank account or anything else you have to do online you go to driftwatch.org and uh, you give them the same information you normally would you create a username and an email address and a password and you sign up and then you give them your name, your address, um, that sort of thing, your phone number. Um, and then, oops, I went a little too fast there. And uh, then you can sign up. Um, you know, if you're an applicator, you can say, I want to I want to know about anybody who's in my county. That'd be a little bit of a larger. You could custom draw an area where you have people where you want to be notified if they're planting um, specialty crops or have bees nearby. 
And then uh, as a grower, you, you select what crop you're going to grow, whether it's conventionally grown, organic, or certified organic, and what dates that crop's going to be in the ground. Uh, here's how you draw the map. You, you get close to your property on the map, and then you hit a little button there that says begin tracing. And then you just go to the corners of your property and you map it out. It's pretty simple. And then you hit a submit button. Once you hit the submit button, uh, that will go to the Indiana State Chemist Office. A young lady down there named Beth Carter will look at that map and make sure it's a farm and not a, not a, a backyard garden or something. And then she'll approve it or reject it or whatever it, it needs to happen. You see, here's a list of the kind of things you can put in there. You got beehives, certified organic Christmas trees, fish farms, fruits and grapes and hardwoods and mints and nursery crops, all kinds of things you can put in there. Uh, we have quite a few people that have organic pastures uh, in, in our um, Drift Watch. Once you, uh, once you sign up, then you will get a notification via email and it will give you a summary of the property that you just plugged in. Uh, you get one of those for each piece of property so that you've got a record of what you submitted. Uh, as I mentioned, Beth Carter, uh, who is with the Office of the Indiana State Chemist Office, who I've gotten to know fairly well over the last three years, is the, uh, the main person that takes care of it. And then Field Watch is actually run out of Purdue University, but it's, it's in... Uh, Almost all the Midwestern states, uh, probably over a third of the states in the U.S. are eligible now for Drift Watch. So thank you. I hope you consider signing up if you haven't done that already. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckerman, Dr. Long, Dr. Myers, and everyone who made this happen. We so appreciate being here joining us.